I think whenever you're ready, Dr. Carly. Thank you. So hello again. Um, I want to remind everyone that I'm delighted to take questions even while I'm talking, so feel free. Uh, just type them into chat or um, and then we'll have the moderator there ask the question. And then afterwards, we'll just open up to open questions and you just raise your hand and we'll take questions then as well. So please, questions are extremely well, well liked. So what we're going to be talking about now is influence campaigns, what they look like in social media, you know, kind of how they're done, how we analyze them and so on. So an influence campaign is basically the activities that are really aimed at shaping your opinion and your activity on a particular issue. Basically, it's someone is trying to manipulate someone else with to achieve a particular impact. Many of these uh, influence campaigns involve disinformation, though not all of them. And of course, disinformation has always been with us, right? And do it connecting influence campaigns has always been with us. In this image, what you're seeing is a bas relief from Ramses II's victory over the Hittite people uh, at the Battle of Kadesh. Now, some people argue that this was actually a semi-defeat. Other people argue it was a success. So the battle still rages in some ways. But the point is that to the whether this is true or false, it was definitely an influence campaign. And it took lots of effort to actually carve these kinds of things into these bass reliefs. Today, influence campaigns look like, you know, the New World Order um, campaign that you see here on the right, which is basically a whole series of arguments thrown into the face of a conspiracy and all of which is spread through social media. And my point about this is this is much more elaborate. OK, it's a much bigger story. It has grown globally, whereas at the time this was just local. It went globally extremely fast and it, it took very little money to spread it. Disinformation um, that is used in influence campaigns has many faces. It, a lot of it looks simply like mischaracterized images or doctored videos. It could be fake actors, etc. And increasingly, it's you know things like unsupported opinion, information taken out of context, deep fakes, etc. Some of it is very easy to identify, and it's unambiguously false. Okay, that information is used in one way in influence campaigns. Some of it is much harder to identify, and it's not clear if it's true or false, and that's used in a different way in influence campaigns. Influence campaigns using um, this latter kind are often much more complex, much more convoluted, and much more long-lasting. In general, in influence campaigns, inaccurate facts in and of themselves, if someone just spouts an inaccurate fact, that alone doesn't really have much impact, okay? Deep facts are still deep fakes are still relatively rare, although they're growing in number. And the but the influence campaigns that are going are actually building groups, actively trying to build groups that are receptive to the kind of disinformation they're going to spread to them, and that are receptive to the storyline around it, and therefore what consequence they want it to have. Bots, trolls, etc., are used to spread this. Now, on social media, there's two kinds of things that are manipulatable. And this is true whether you're on Facebook or Reddit or Twitter or VK or whatever. One thing you can manipulate is the narrative. That is, what is being said, the features of what is being said, the images that are used, the emotional cues within it, and so on. By changing, the cues, the memes, the images, the font, the color, et cetera, as well as the words, you can change the narrative. The other thing that can be changed in social media is the community. You can literally change who the opinion leader is. You can literally change the size of a group, the membership of a group, whether two groups are connected. 
and things that influence the network structure or the position of the opinion leader, such as by following actors or by getting them introduced to each other and so on, are are part of what can be are part of the manipulations that can be done. Effective manipulations on social media often involve doing both, manipulating the narrative and manipulating the community. To understand how this works, let's think about what social media looks like. Well, social media is organized into these little topic oriented communities, which I'm showing you kind of notionally up here. That is, you have these groups of people who are more or less talking to each other about more or less the same things. These groups range in size, they range and they range in topic size. For example, the plane spotters is a fairly large group talking about a very narrow topic. You know, what, you know, tail things and patterns are for what planes they've spotted. And it's a very long lasting group. Other groups are much more ephemeral, such as that that forms around every new movie that comes out, talking about whether they liked it or didn't, didn't like it. Some of these topic oriented uh, communities have an offline analog, such as the alt-right or the Dallas cheerleaders. Some do not. And they come and go because of that. But all of them can take on a pathological form. And the pathological form is the echo chamber. The echo chamber, unlike the topic oriented community, is not just more or less talking to each other about more or less the same thing. It is exactly talking all to all. Everyone is talking to each other and they really are all talking about the same thing. So it has high connectivity. For those of you who like network analysis and so on, that means that it has high density. OK, lots of connections, but it has it at two levels. It has it at the community level and it has it at the knowledge level in terms of who is talking about what. That high connectivity does several things to you as a human being if you're a member of one of these groups. It leads to a lack of objectivity. It causes groups to focus on stories and common stories. It creates in the members of the group this sense of sharing and goodness and I'm part of something bigger than myself. It also leads to suspicion or hostility to newcomers. Uh, and it leads to rapid introduction, interaction and rapid spread of new narratives. So you can say, well, for my science group, this might be a great thing, right? But it's also the case that these kind of groups are prone to amygdala hijack. The other thing I will say about uh, about these groups is that they all tend to be in usually in operating in only a single language. And then the members around them will the membership will typically grow in response to external events. But let's, what is this amygdala hijack thing that echo chambers are prone to? Well, the amygdala is the part of your brain that controls emotions and it control is, it's one of the things that controls emotions. And it also is uh, related to the number of people that you are willing to have in your social network, how easy it is for you to make friends or make enemies. So, the emo when you have an amygdala hijack, what happens is your brain gets sort of, sort of emotionally overloaded and you stop making decisions with a rational part of your brain and start responding to things emotionally. Now, you may be toppled over into an amygdala hijack. That's a very high intensity adrenaline rush type thing. And it's hard to stay there. So people get toppled over and then they will gradually relax from it and get back more into the rational part. So you, when you want to get people to respond in a certain way, you topple them into this hijack, give them something to respond emotionally to, they'll do it, then they'll topple, slowly topple back. That's part of an influence campaign, and we'll see more how this plays out. But first, let's talk about who is on social media. Well, when you're in social media, there'll be posts and things from organizations, groups, etc., governments, news agencies, companies. There'll be posts from individuals, and there'll be posts from bots, bots being fully automated accounts. Now, all of these will be posting in the same space, often without a notice that says, hi, I'm a bot, hi, I'm a company. And it's up to you to recognize the name and decide which one it is. Cognitively, 
When you get information, you rarely remember where you heard it from. Cognitively, when you see these things, you usually do not take the time to discern what kind of actor it is. And I will tell you, most people are terrible at spotting bots. In fact, you're better at spotting bots that disagree with you than those that agree with you. You're, if you're a Republican, you're more likely to spot Democratic bots. If you're a Democrat, you're more likely to spot Republican bots. If you like, if you don't believe in gun control, you're more likely to spot bots promoting gun control and so on. So they're out there, but in general, we're terrible at fighting them. From a social network perspective, what this means is that we've got three kinds of actors that are all playing a role and are part of the communication networks. Now, what do bots do? Well, these bots can mislead, they can spread rumors, slander, they can spread spam, they spread malware, they impact trending topics, they can increase activity, but they also can impact who is viewed as influential and they can direct people to be contacted to other people. They can also spread good information. Bots in and of themselves aren't bad, right? There are many bots that have done things such as warn people of disasters. There's Big Ben, which simply sends out there and sends out bongs every hour to tell you what time of day it is. There's another one that sends out messages like a passage from the Bible each day. Another one sends out passage from the Quran. There's lots of different bots doing many, many things, but they impact both the narrative and the network. They impact the network because they, for example, follow certain people and that therefore they make them look more important. They impact the narrative because they, they can tweet out a particular word faster and more times and in more languages than a human can, making that idea trend. Okay, this has been used, for example, by um, Korean pop groups in order to get their information out and help them become very popular throughout the world, making their ideas trend. OK, tools that are used in influence campaigns are all of these things, right? They're doctored videos, deep fakes, trolls, cyborgs, etc. Cyborgs are those uh, actors that are sometimes played by bots and sometimes by humans. Each of these have been used in influence campaigns. And most importantly, the most important tool used in influence campaign is you because it's your susceptibility to information and disinformation. It's your critical thinking skills or lack of critical thinking skills. It's your emotional intelligence that is being worked on and manipulated. I want to describe an example of a cyborg influence campaign just to give you a feeling. Um, in this case, um, this is actually affected against NATO. Uh, there were all of these accounts uh, that I mean, there's this one. There's I'm sorry. There's this one account that is always sending out positive messages about Twitter about NATO. Okay, and that's great, but the messages often come at times much more frequently than a human could send them. They're often from they now and then occur in multiple languages and so on. And this account is actually played by a bot some of the time, but every now and then a, humans will, a human will come in behind it and start sending additional new information. So it's kind of goes back and forth. As another example of one, uh, there are all these accounts that were run by humans that were uh, the Japanese anime accounts, okay, set up by human beings to spread Japanese anime. These were then just out there spreading it and all of a sudden some of them were taken over or appeared to be taken over and they started spreading out a bunch of anti NATO messaging. And then they went back to Japanese anime. That was a human in the loop acting affecting the cyborg. So how do we study influence campaigns? We study it using what's called the Ben framework. The brain framework looks at who is doing what to whom with what impact. By whom we don't try to decide, is it Joe or Martha doing it? Instead, we're look, trying to decide what kind of actor is doing it. Is this a bot? Is this a troll? Is this a cyborg? Is this a news agency? Is this a super spreader? Is it a super friend? We'll talk more about those in a second. You know, so we're trying to look at who generically is doing it so we can get more better at the theory of influence. 
and we look at to whom who is being impacted. Is this being aimed at an individual? Like, are they mentioning focusing on following a specific individual? Or is it being aimed at a community by altering the dialogue of a group, by mentioning multiple people in the group, and so on? And then we try to measure the impact by measuring such things as the level of echo chamberness, the level of polarization that results, the level of hysteria that results. And for did what, we're looking at what we call the Ben maneuvers. We have at this point identified 16 maneuvers, eight of which alter the narrative and eight of which can be used to shape or alter the community. These include both positive and negative facing uh, actions that can and we have seen happening. This is completely generic. It works for any social media platform. And, um, you know, it has been most tested in Twitter, but it is being tested now in other platforms, even as we speak. Dr. Carly, let's talk about these. Yes. A uh, question in the chat can an echo chamber be used as a tool? If you build a echo chamber, you can then direct it against others. That's one thing you can do. So, so the echo chamber can indeed be used as a tool. Moreover, you can also build an echo chamber out of bots, which is itself a tool. Roger, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about these super spreaders and super friends. A super spreader is an actor who has undue influence who has this exceptional ability to spread information, get the information out. There's many ways of trying to measure this and you know everybody keeps coming up with new ways, but these are individuals who are actors when they send out messages, it's more likely to somehow get into your inbox in some way. They're often will appear on multiple, they often have cross platform links. They often, they may have other actors around them respouting what they say. They may just be incredibly popular. They may have bought followers, whatever. The super friends in contrast are individuals or communicators who have an exceptional ability to get involved in the dialogue to build trust and to get the dialogue to shift in certain directions. Where the super spreaders are great at sending out pronouncements, okay? Like telling people where you're going to meet, telling people, yay, so-and-so did so, such and such. Super friends are good at shifting the conversation. Now, of course, you have a whole bunch, and what makes a super friend is they're engaged in these two-way exchanges. I may, you may uh, retweet me and I may follow you and you may follow me and I may quote you. So, but we have this kind of two way re reciprocal relations going on and reciprocal relations are often called trust relations because of this. In these trust relations, in these individual super friends, if you had a whole bunch of them that were connected to each other, they would of course form an echo chamber. So, and then their ability, and yes, any member of an echo chamber has an equal ability with the other members of the echo chamber to really change the dialogue of the group. The trouble is, if they have a whole bunch of them right together, they're all also reining each other in. And as a result, things just echo around inside, as opposed to actually just shifting conversations. Dr. Carly, real quick, a backtrack to uh, the Ben framework. To what extent do social media companies like Twitter and Facebook use tools similar to Bend to the Bend framework or collaborate with the social cybersecurity academic field? So to the best of my knowledge, not a single social media platform is using the Bend framework. And none of them have asked to collaborate with respect to it. And it has been in existence now for about year and three quarters. And so as far as we can tell, they're not doing anything like it. So in terms of information maneuvers, um, half the maneuvers that I mentioned deal with the narrative, right? And the four Ds are dismiss, distort, dismay, and distract came out of these, you know, came out of information warfare work. 
and they're tried and true, well validated, et cetera. And we can see frequent cases where these occur. However, in social media, you can often win, you know, catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. And that's why we have the positive ones, which are engage, explain, excite, and enhance. What these maneuvers do is they affect what is being talked about, how it's being talked about, and they alter the knowledge network, who knows what information. These maneuvers, I want to draw your attention to two of them, excite and dismay. Excite and dismay are very emotional maneuvers, right? They're the ones that would be used to topple a, a, an echo chamber over into an amygdala hijack. You can do it either by doing things to bring joy and happiness, or you can do it by things that get people angry or sad or upset. Given you know, the way our languages work around the world, there's actually more negative terms than positive, so it's almost easier to do this getting people angry and upset, but we've seen both happen. And for example, after sporting events, if your team wins, people are spreading discussions to bring joy and happiness, talking about how great your team was and how great the, some player was. Let's look at these campaigns in social media. Here's an excite and a dismay campaign. On the left is an excite campaign that was sent out talking about Trump supporters drinking mega cocktails, showing in a garden drinking one made out of bleach. Now, this is completely OK, a piece of disinformation. OK, uh, because, you know, she did not make this each cocktail out of, blink, out of bleach and drink it. But it was meant to cause excitement among people and get them happy because, yay, you can get rid of COVID and yay and so on. On the right is a dismay campaign that was also sent out in multiple different social media platforms talking about how the World Health Organization admits that asymptomatic transmission of COVID is rare and pointing out that everything about COVID-19 hysteria fostered by the World Health Organization as the implication has been a lie. They're trying to make you angry and upset, both at science of the World Health Organization, but also just about the entire event. These are two very classic examples. Here's an example of an enhanced campaign. In an enhanced campaign, you're trying to add to the conversation by giving people an additional thing to think about. So for example, rather than greeting someone by shaking hands, this is the beginning of the coronavirus outbreak when they said social distancing, you know, wear gloves, don't touch people. You know, the idea was let's go around and all greet each other, you know, as the Vulcan said, long love and live long and prosper. And in fact, uh, people did start greeting each other that way. And the meme that's like, and things like this were one of the things that promoted that. As a distort campaign, the one on the right, again, appeared on multiple different social media platforms, was basically calling into question what were hospitals doing. The, now, those numbers could be 100% true, right? But they're saying, that they only get it if they diagnose a death as, as COVID-19, implying that hospitals wanted to diagnose things as COVID-19, even if they weren't, because they get, got this extra money. Again, not true. It was a distortion of the facts where that logic actually went the other way. Again, very, very, very typical ones. Distortion campaigns often use numbers, take them out of context or dates and take them out of context. This is an enhance and a dismiss campaign. The enhance campaign on the left is talking about, um, is from Russian insider and saying that Israel's Iron Dome defense is a failure. Russia's system actually worked and here's why. It's a very positive messaging system in some sense. Uh, well, it's positive if you're on the Russian side. The second one is a dismiss campaign, and it's talking about Syrians are being attacked. We must help them by attacking them too, showing an overweight, you know, U.S. person, um, you know, USA. Belittling, making fun of, okay, being derogatory about something is a classic way of doing dismissal, right? But let's look a little bit more at this about this enhanced one here. That's a very complex message, actually, that Russia Insider is sending. 
And it actually includes an enhancement because they're talking, they're adding to the discussion of the Israel's Iron Dome by talking about Russia's system. Then they're explaining why it works, okay? By, by uh, giving you, here's why I'm pointing you to a blog site, which in turn creates dismay in people who are in favor of Israel's Iron Dome. So it's a very, so you can have multiple maneuvers in a single message. And many, many times you will see that happening. Now, the, the narrative maneuvers are easy to understand, I think. They're pretty easy for most people to pick up on. Harder ones to get at are the ones that manipulate community, the ones that manipulate who is talking to whom. These include the back uh, maneuver, which are anything you do to increase the importance of opinion leader or create an opinion leader. There was actually a woman in the Midwest who became, who was backed by bots and other things to the point where she became an opinion leader about what people like to watch on TV purely through a campaign. Neutralize our actions that limit the effectiveness of an opinion leader, such as reducing the number of people who follow them uh, or using derogatory replies or attend to them. Okay, and we'll see some examples of that in a moment. The other methods like building, bridging, boosting are ways of building groups, bringing groups together, or at least creating the appearance that those things have been done. Nuking, narrowing, and neglecting are just the opposite, right? They're breaking down a group, they're causing it to be dismantled, to be ignored, or to make it so tiny that nobody really cares about it. The, all these actions change who is talking to whom, who are the leaders of the state, and they change the social network. These kinds of maneuvers can be done through images, they can be done using app mentions, they can be done through following and replying and retweeting. OK, there's actions you can take in your messages that affect the network structure, not just the narrative. As an example, here is a bridge uh, campaign that was waged <coughs> during the reopen campaigns in Pennsylvania. I want you, you to look very closely at this image on your left here, because this image shows you they're talking about reopen PA and they're talking about their checks, right? It might, you know, you know, my, my you're going to stop my check. We're going to stop your vote, right? They're talking about the, the shutdown from an economic perspective. But they've included in here this guy who's talking about my rights on end where your fear starts. So what they're doing here is they're building a bridge between a group who is passionately upset because they are not getting checked. They're not getting money because they're not getting paid because they're out of work due to COVID with those people who have been arguing about rights. The rights they were talking about here are rights like the right not to wear a face mask. They're talking to people who are talking about, you know, the right, um, you know, um, not they're talking about other rights like the right not to get vaccinated and they built bridges between those two communities and then got them together so they would engage in future protests together. On the right is an example of a nuke is a is someone reporting on a nuke campaign. In point of fact, when, you know, um, Facebook and Instagram banned Trump they were basically nuking the person, right? They were saying this person can't be part of the network of speech on this platform, okay? Twitter, you know, they removed Trump, all Trump and all his tweets go away, right? That's that's a classic nuke maneuver. When QAnon, I, I'm sorry, when um, Anonymous was able to get all of the ISIS accounts banned, that was a nuke maneuver. Here's an example of another way of actually engaging in neutralization. In this case, we've got C.T. Lau, who's a human being, who's a critic of the, of the Chinese government, the Chinese state-sponsored media. Here we have a bot going by the name C.T. Lau with a slightly different handle, C.T. Lau 3. 
they're neutralizing CT Lao because they're sending out messages under what looks like the same account, but that are now pro Chinese. That I mean, they're pro the Chinese government, pro the Chinese Communist Party, um, you know, and and so on. So they're actually in this way discrediting that person. So creating accounts that mimic other accounts is a classic uh, neutralization maneuver. Here's two other ones. On the left is a build account attack, and on the right is a nuke attack. On the left, what you're really seeing happening is there's this community of young men out there. This is in the Ukraine before the Euro, or during the Euro, near the Euromaidan revolution. And the young men like to share soft porn images of women. They just like to send out tweets with these images in it. As far as we can tell, the young men had no knowledge of each other. A couple of them might have, but they weren't a community. Enter the Euromaidan bot. What the Euromaidan bot did was it started, first it mentioned all the other Euromaidan bots, and so it became a community that Twitter, it was now this little echo chamber that Twitter now pays attention to. Then each of those bots within it started sending out messages that mentioned two or more of these young men and sometimes included a soft porn image. Okay, that message was then sent, they had ended into the feeds, right? of those young men because they were mentioned. And moreover, that means you know, each of those young men now saw the names of other young men like them. So many of those young men then started to follow not just the bot, but the other men that were like that were mentioned in that thing because Twitter started just recommending them to each other. If you like this, you'll also like this. And before long, you had this community of guys all following each other, all sharing these images. At that point, they were more of an echo chamber, and the bot then started sending messages about where to go to get engaged in the fight, where they could get guns, and about why they should get in involved in the Yomi Don revolution. So it was kind of a build, build your army and then bait them into fighting. On the right is a new contempt of social influence. Uh, in this case, here we have Finland. Finland looks completely blanked out. All those little black dots are tweets. Now, if you were to go in with the Twitter API at this time and wanted to know what the people in Finland were thinking about some issue, you would, you know, you might put a bounding box or Finland, or you might put in certain Finnish words, and you're going to get back tweets. You're only get a set, getting a sample. This bot is producing so many tweets that the majority of the sample that you get is going to be whatever that bot is saying. What is that bot doing? Well, it was designed by this nice Finnish mathematician who just loves Finnish numbers, like just adores Finnish numbers. And all it's doing is counting from zero to infinity in Finnish. OK, which is going to go on forever. And it's and it's and because he loves Finland and Finnish, he decided to layer it over his own country. So he's effectively nuking his own country because now all you're getting is zero, one, two, three and Finnish going left to right, up to down over and over and over again. This is like a denial of service attack, but it's occurring in Twitter. This kind of thing is easy to do, right? MIT students have done it to, to Harvard during the Harvard football game, like clearing over the Harvard airspace, okay? This is not hard, but it effectively can change what people are able to see in social media. Another example of, a, of an attack, in this case, they're they're doing what appears to be a backing attempt, but they're really trying to neutralize something. Yana Craig is actually a freelance journalist uh, who is re was reporting on the co uh, conflict in Yemen. Very popular, got out a lot of inf important information very, very quickly. Now, what's happening here is all of a sudden here in 2018, all of a sudden her number of followers just went up choo, really, really high, really, really fast, right? Almost 20,000 new followers overnight. If you looked at who those um, followers were, okay, they were basically looked like sock puppets, and these are some of the nice ones. If you went down and looked at many of them, instead of uh, just the kind of standard default image, had a very um, lewd or rude image, often with very lewd names. 
and so on. And they were trying to get her, in a sense, banned by associating with um, nasty characters. She actually went in, and but it looked like a backing attempt, right? Now she has lots of even more followers, right? She actually went in to try to get these actors banned, and she found that it takes it takes much longer in Twitter to get someone removed from your account than it does to set up a new account. It takes much longer to get someone removed from your account than it does to back someone, okay? And so after a while, she realized that was gonna take all of her time and she wouldn't get the news out. So she just said, forget it. I'm just gonna keep spreading the news. But this was an, is a neutralization attempt. Bots that are used can be used as megaphones or brokers. They can actually be used in lots more ways as well. But the two that are most often used in influence campaigns to date have been the megaphone approach and the broker approach. In the megaphone approach, what bots are doing is they're surrounding your source and they're, and whenever the source tweets certain kinds of information, they pick it up and retweet it out. Now, I will point out that many news agencies, legitimate news agencies, will have bots around them like this that they simply use to retweet their news, you know, their, their headline stories, their breaking news. So it appears every hour, you know, on the day. So it appears at the top of people's feeds. These megaphone bots, though, often are used. Uh, what's different between them and a news agency bot is that they're only sitting there focusing on certain types of messages. Broker bots are ones that connect various groups. If we look at um, the bots that are spreading Chinese and Russian state sponsored media, they're often megaphone bots, or the ones around disinformation sites, megaphone bots. If we looked at what was happening in the Euro Madan, you have these kind of broker bots. If we look at during the 2016 elections, the 2020 elections, the Swedish elections, broker bots like this were often used to build bridges between different conservative groups, making them more coordinated and making them pay attention to each other and realize they were a community. So who is spreading disinformation and how does this play into so these influence campaigns? First off, most disinformation is spread in the US is spread by other, you know, humans, right? 77% of the time, people in the US are spreading disinformation. More of all the stuff that's spread, 77% of it comes from humans. Bots are usually spreading by retweeting stuff, but bots are usually spreading it by taking stuff that are on these fake news sites, these low credibility news sites, and then spreading it out. Then it gets to US citizens who pick it up and respread it more. Compared to other countries, okay, US citizens compared in, in our data that we have from the early pandemic, more of the, dis, more than it's from throughout the world, there was more disinformation at that point in time being spread by people in the US than from any other country at that point in time, even when you controlled for the size of the country. Uh, the, so you get stuff, disinformation coming from these fake news sites, okay, it's then retweeted by bots, it gets out to people, and then they further retweet it. So you've got, so influence campaigns are in part about how to get your information from the source, in this case a disinformation site, out to enough people that they will take over for you and spread it for, for you. Uh, bots have been were very useful in that they don't necessarily spread all types of disinformation. They were predominantly used for spreading uh, disinformation rather than just general information, and for even more dominantly spreading disinformation that was either lethal or conspiracy-like. So information about uh, COVID being a bioweapon, information about uh, drink bleach to cure yourself, those things had more bot activity in spreading them than did the less overall. So if you ask the question, how can we prosecute people who are spreading disinformation? Part of the question is, okay, are you gonna are you going to prosecute the person who's actually the actor account that's spreading it or the one that is behind the scenes directing that account? Dr. Carley. Yes. Why do you think that Americans are more likely than other global citizens to spread disinformation? 
Um, I think several several different. I think several different reasons. Partly it was because a lot of the disinformation was, even though it was appearing in other countries, was being aimed at the U.S. Okay, it was uh, it was targeting U.S. concerns uh, and things that were not as relevant in other countries. A second reason for that is because there were these bots that were being used to get it over to the U.S. that were then the U.S. citizens picked it up, whereas those same bots were not retweeting from the local newspapers and the local sites in those other countries near as much. During the South American protests, though, it appears that there are bots tweeting being used in the same kind of strategy, but focusing the spread of disinformation from external sites to South America in order to promote um, the spread of disinformation and more importantly, to undermine democracy and promote uh, totalitarian movements in those countries. So same strategy. So partly okay, thank you. OK, so what so just again, just make sure you've got the pattern right. You've got these disinformation or fake news sites. People are reading, watching those bots are watching those. But those bots are then also being picked up by people who are busy retweeting both the bots and the people. State sponsored media, bots are picking it up, sending it out, and people are busy retweeting it. Videos on YouTube, bots are spreading it, people are using it, and then people are retweeting it. Okay, so a lot of your retweets and things, again, coming from bots. And those are three of your big sources of disinformation and a lot of the influence campaigns you see that have disinformation at their heart are here. Now, if it's a marketing influence campaign, those are going to be different, right? They're going to come from different sources. They might still come from YouTube, but they're more likely to come from uh, corporate accounts and other things like that. Same strategy will be used. These are the ones that are dealing specifically um, with disinformation as opposed to product marketing. A successful influence campaign, one of the things it will do is it will convert a regular topic oriented community into an echo chamber. Remember that these communities are groups that are more or less talking to each other. Um, they're focused on more or less the same issues and they're all more or less talking about those things. So what happens in the social influence campaign is they build bridges among the individuals so they become really all talking to each other. They focus the discussion around certain topics so that everybody is talking about, in this case, are you? And then they get all the people talking about the same thing. So they increase the densification of these things, turning a group into more and more of an echo chamber. Because if I can get something to turn into an echo chamber, I can control the next level of activity using excite and dismay um, maneuvers to topple them over into an amygdala hijack and get them to act in certain ways. We saw this kind of an activity going on again in a lot of the different elections. Now, in influence campaigns, they Dr. Often, Carly, real quick. Yes. Uh, two slides back. Uh, how have you operationalized state sponsored media? Ah, um, so we have a set of news agents. Well, first off, those are publicly known. Um, so we have a set of news news companies, uh, news agencies, and we know which ones are owned by which state, right? And that's a state sponsored media. And so uh, our group has has worked with this company to put together a list of state sponsored media throughout the world. And it's just it just takes you know going into the internet and looking. Okay, who bought this one? Who owns this? You know. Like that. Roger, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that not all state sponsored media is busy sending disinformation. OK. Um, a successful influence. OK, I talked about this. OK, the next point I want to make is with respect to uh, influence campaigns. These maneuvers that we mentioned, these Ben maneuvers, can be used together, right? We saw that one with the Israel Iron Dome one. But in here, what we're seeing happening, in fact, is that most influence campaigns will combine multiple maneuvers together. So, for example, you might uh, back someone you want to become a key, a key influencer. Then you might boost the group, 
right? Uh, to kind of uh, with selected comments, content, and with membership, etc. And then you might send out dismay messages to get them to topple over and react and get zapped, right? So oftentimes we will, you know, influence campaigns will utilize multiple maneuvers in a kind of a well laid out campaign. If you actually look at some of these campaigns over time, you will see coordinated activities where they transition from one type of a maneuver to another. And some of these campaigns, you know, last months. OK, these are some of these aren't these are not just. You know, I put up a post of a of a sharks in the water thing that happens in every disaster that has water. These some of these are very well orchestrated and some of these are laid out by media firms who have been hired to actually lay out an influence campaign over multiple months and across multiple media platforms. For us to discover them, you know, we use this pipeline approach where we you know, collect our data, we run it through NetMapper, which operates in over 40 languages using computational linguistics. Uh, to extract the semantic networks that people are, and to extract the sentiment and to extract the cues. We have a whole set of machine learning tools we've developed. Uh, most of these, like the bot hunter, the hate speech detector, our new troll hunter we're working on, the locator, the active classifier, those are all language agnostic and can work on any language. Our political stance one is the only one that is language sensitive. It's based off the English language. And it basically identifies where you're more the more conservative or more liberal. It sort of kind of works uh, for all Romance languages and, there, and for what works in Western Europe, where the stances are pretty much the same as U.S., but it's um, it's it's basically English based. Then we take things into Aura for our network analytics, and Aura has a whole bunch of it's a network analysis visualization tool. You'll hear more about that on the technical day. Uh, but it also um, will let you, it has ways in it for measuring polarization, super spreaderness, super friendness, echo chamberness, for, for, and for measuring which of the bend maneuvers are present in the tweets that you have. Now it has version two operationalization of bend. NetMapper, like I mentioned, it's a text mining tool for extracting networks and node attributes from texts. It supports semantic network extraction, meta network, which is it can actually do things like identify all telephone numbers. It can tell you whether or not an actor met what when it sees the, the concepts in a row in a message, it'll say, oh, these are people, these are locations, etc. Fairly well. Uh, it does sentiment extraction and the cues extraction, which is identifying those emotional tells in it. Uh, and it operates on the PC and Mac and so on. Uh, it's actually one of the things that was sent to our idea center uh, by one of our sponsors. Aura is a um, is a network analytic package that we use. It lets you analyze anything you can put in a network form. You can analyze. Unlike all the other network tools out there, it actually operates in high dimensionality, meaning you can have multiple types of nodes, like people, like and hashtags and locations, all. Um, you can have all of those and it correctly knows which nodes to combine with which and which algorithms to apply for which. And it can also visualize things. It also can handle extremely large networks. So uh, the professional version of it can handle networks as large as 10 to the six nodes. And it really sort of depends on the size of your computer um, and so on. And there's also a PC and Mac version and a web version of that one. And it links to lots and lots of other tools. This is an example of a topic oriented uh, assessment. It's part of the Bend report in Aura. It, here we're starting a social influence campaign by we took in a whole bunch of tweets. We ran NetMapper to get the cues. We ran the bot under on it to identify bots, et cetera. We put it in the Bend report and what it identified was a set of these topic oriented communities. For each one, it's measuring its echo chamberness. We can see that they vary. Here's one that's fairly high in echo chamberness. Uh, it measures their EI index, which is are they facing externally or internally? The more positive, the more external facing, the more internal, the more, the more negative, the more internal facing. And it's talking about what are they talking about? So this is a very closed in echo chamber. This is talking about photos and about river, river and boating photography. 
That's all they care about. Okay, they would be very easy to excite if you told them about a new camera that could work underwater to do things. Okay, this is one that is focusing externally that's talking about COVID idiots. Okay, and it's trying to proselytize to other groups. So you, it gives you this kind of information. You can then select particular members to look at. Okay, and for the individuals, it tells you whether they're bots or how many things they've authored, etc. So it lets you understand who is doing what, and then using that, you can then analyze things. We're going to use these tools now, and I'm going to show you the result of using them to analyze something that we thought was simply going to be a polarization campaign. Now, from lots of studies, what we've discovered is that the information maneuvers that I've talked about, the band maneuvers, occur in this fashion if you're in fact talking about uh, if you're trying to polarize a group that is you will have people come in they will boost the group up they will join both sides of the issue like pro and anti-vax pro and anti-gun control pro and anti-nato pro and anti whatever you want okay and they will boost both sides of the groups up and that means it will add bring in what looks like more people and they will build connections to more people so that the group gets more dense in terms of its social network structure. Then they will either send an excite message in one and a display message in the other, or they will wait till one of those messages naturally occurs, and then they will send the opposite message in the other. Because you want both groups to get excited sort of at the same time. And then you back the opinion leader in both groups, and then you engage with them on the pro side, you engage to make them more and more excited, or, or, or it could be just me. On one side, you can work to get them more excited. On the other side, you work to get them more angry, more upset. And that increases polarization. This is a polarization tactic. It can be spread out and done over and over again. You can do it on the same group. And once they're like this, you can topple them over with an amygdala hijack. When they come back, you re you add a few more people, you boost them up again, and you can repeat. Okay, this is how polarization tends to work, and our influence maneuvers have been to help find it. But now let's look at the reopen campaigns in the U.S. In these reopen campaigns, there were a lot of there were some small protests. They started in March and early April. They were against the COVID nineteen restrictions in the U.S. Um, one of the earliest ones was in Michigan. It was called Operation Gridlock. And there was a bunch of stuff on it in the various social media platforms. On the 16th, the Trump administration issued guidelines for opening up. On the 17th, uh, Trump retweeted out Liberate Michigan and Minnesota and Virginia. Okay, by May 1st, there were demonstrations in half the states. And, you know, there was lots of use of Facebook and in organizing these and promoting these events. There's lots of discussion in Twitter about them, and they're pointing to the Facebook pages to see how it's organized. There's people discussing this on Reddit and so on. What's going on there? We thought, well, I mean, I thought maybe this is just they're building more polarization around pro and anti vaxxing or pro and anti reopening. In point of fact, they used a slightly different strategy was being used to actually grow a protest. And it's a very diabolical strategy because you had bots and trolls and cyborgs that were that were created just just a little before the um, the first reopen campaign. They joined both of the groups and they started boosting the groups up. So far, it looks just like, you know, looks just like a polarization event. Then on the pro reopen side, they started sending dismay ones, making the people angry and angrier. Are you lost? Did you lose your check? I lost mine too. I'm not getting paid either. I lost my job. You know, various things like that. Um, they also sent disinformation as part of those dismay ones that argued that these hospitals are empty. What are these guys talking about? On the on the anti reopen side, what they're doing is they're sending out tons of different messages. But rather than being all coordinated, they're very confused. There's 20,000 different reasons why you should stay like locked down. There's not just a simple clear messaging, stay locked down. There's tons of different re things that count, try to counter a whole bunch of some other weird things. OK, so there's a lot of distortion creating confusion. On the pro side, 
They then say, we're going to have these camp these uh, protests that creates excitement. They back leaders of the protests and they try to engage people in getting involved in the protests by talking about different things they could put on their signs and things on. On the anti reopen side, you're they're basically trying to neutralize the groups. They're basically uh, and neutralize the leaders. You know, they're sending negative attacks on some of the leaders. They're uh, backing other leaders instead, like instead of backing the governor, they're backing, you know, some new pundit in the, in the state. And they're engaging people, but they're engaging them about things that aren't on point, right? So you've got growing confusion on one side and growing anger and excitement on the other. Now, meanwhile, what's going on, what's going on simultaneously is I, is that there's been since February, and remember these, these protests are in April, there was this disinformation that was breeding intolerance thing that was going on. So in February, we had a bunch of people speaking, doing hate speech, they're the red dots. The blue dots are the people who are just speaking normally. The yellow dots are the people who are sending out tweets with abusive language in it, right? And the bots are used, are basically introducing the hate speech people to them, forming these hate groups. These are forming in mid-March, right? By April, not these groups are larger and there's more people out there spouting hate. And there's more tweets out there with hate in them, many of which are retweets of these individuals that are being done by bots. And moreover, they're, although the original focus was China and cruise ships, they've shifted their attention to anti-science. During as the as these reopen campaigns started, not only was it anti the CDC and the World Health Organization, it became anti certain governors. In particular, some of this was directed at Democratic governors in the areas where these protests were. The hate speech uh, in the U.S. Okay, um, is very much focused on politics, okay, and on race. Very much that's where the hate speech is focused on. In contrast, uh, that's not, I mean, that's it's different in different countries. If you look at the hate speech itself and look at um, the role of bots, what bots who are doing is they're mainly retweeting. And if you look at their position in the networks, they are actually serving to link different hate people together. And we see this by the fact that they have these high between us, closeness, eigenvector, Etc., and they're not necessarily the highest in degree. They're not just spouting a lot of stuff. So you have bots connecting the hate group people, and they're and they're mainly and the and the people who are spreading hate are mainly focusing from a political angle and focusing around race and nationality. Now, all of this uh, laid the groundwork for science is the enemy. Starting in April fifth, which is before the protests, which again were like the eighteenth. There was a surge of attacks against expert advisors. OK, it turns out this surge of attacks are by these new accounts that were set up, which are some of the same accounts that took part in the protests. Disinformation was used to discredit the medical community. There were about 45,000 tweets, at least that we were able to find. 69% of them appeared to be coming from uh, appeared to be coming from bots. Overall, in the reopen campaign, about 30% of the actors appeared to be bots. That's way more than across all the rest of the pandemic stuff. That's way more than you saw in the Black Lives Matter protests. This was very, very different in terms of much higher proportion of bots, much more coordinated, and much more consistent use of new accounts in these two attacking ways. Um, and now you see that this has been going, it started growing in February and, and it grew more and more and more in April and, and so on. From a bend approach, when we look at the community, you see that a lot of the documents that were being sent out during this time were enhance, were enhancements, trying to tell people more and more about, you know, why it basically other reasons to be upset or other reasons, uh, other things about COVID or other things about the protests. OK, some of them were distortion. These were mainly aimed at the uh, anti-protest group. OK, 
There was some nuking and neutralizing going on, mainly aimed at the anti-protest group. Excitement was mainly aimed at the pro-protest group. Different strategies on two sides. This shows you the raise in new accounts that came in. Of the new accounts that, that were, these were new accounts that were just started in Twitter. Many of the new accounts were on the pro-protest side, especially those that were started um, starting in March and early April. Some of them, though, were also on the pro-protest side. It's very important that they're on both sides, right? Because on the on the pro-protest side, they have a very coordinated interaction. They're busy t telling people and getting them excited, and they're and so on. On the anti-protest side, they're discoordinated. They're not working together, and they're sending out different kinds of messages, basically sowing confusion. If we look at what's happening in the real world, here we have Operation Gridlock occurring, okay, and then you see a surge of activity. Then you see issuance of the national gui guidance, okay, that came out, and you had a little surge in activity. Then you had uh, the real journal Trump saying he's liberate Michigan, and you had a humongous surge of activity. This here, this peak, is picked up is really one of the reasons it's so big is you have all of these new accounts okay or many of these new accounts many of the bots acting as megaphones around trump were basically retweeting that message out like crazy so when you collect this data you know and you look at it it's just like this retreat 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 of the same message by the same people okay uh now the similar kind of thing is happening about masks OK, if we look from February, you know, forward, there's a lot of discussion on about uh, about wearing face masks. It varies slightly by state. You're seeing four different states here. It, it always peaks after a governor or someone makes a new pronouncement about face masks or about COVID. OK, but what's happening underlying this is about 37 percent of this comes to be by bots. Uh, I'm sorry, about 37% of the tweets are coming from what appear to be bots. About 25% of the actors appear to be bots. Fewer than on the on the reopen stuff, notice. But many of these are the same bots. And of those ones, what they're also doing is they're building links between the anti-face masks group, well, I just can't stand wearing these things group, and the group who were saying, I'm out of work, I need a job, I can't deal with this, okay? Bots, like I said, are dominating this discussion. Okay, definitely dominating the discussion about reopening America. If you would read Twitter and just say, oh, wow, it looks like a lot of Americans want to reopen, you're being misled. It is not, this is not an organic green thing. The con among the, it was also supported by appeals to various conspiracy the theories. Tweets and retweets were being used that were pulling in information from a variety of blog sites, from a variety of fake news sites talking about such things as COVID-19 itself as a hoax. The hospitals are empty, not overwhelmed. Coronavirus itself is a lie, and it was caused by 5G, uh, that the hospitals were moving mannequins around as part of the COVID cover-up, that the pandemic was being planned. These are the stories that were being appealed to and retweeted and retweeted to try to promote more and more people to get involved in the protests. And they did affect people and people did start falling for these conspiracy theories. Remember that conspiracy theories are often linked and are often used to mobilize people into acting in extreme ways and to engage in violent actions. Now, many of the messages being sent are also anti-vax and anti-face mask at the same time. And of course, it's being used to distort people's understanding of the Constitution and to argue about what free speech really means and, 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 and distort what it says in the Constitution from what it, and to claim that it's saying things that it did not say. So there's many things that are going out and claiming that they're the true American son. One of the tweets includes this picture of the, with, of a bell with this thing about liberty and the Constitution in it. And everyone said, see, even JFK believed it. That bell did not exist on JFK's ship. That bell was used in a movie and, mo and it never, and JFK probably never saw it. And many of the things that you're seeing that they're cl making claims to are things that they got from movies 
and that are lying and are being used to support these various conspiracies. So all these images and things are taken out of, you know, cinematography. The pro and anti groups, uh, because of the influence campaigns, were very they were very cleverly orchestrated. You'll notice that if you look at the pro and anti protest movements, there's actually more tweets that are anti protest than pro protest. Uh, and but but the number of original tweets, things that weren't retweeted, is about the same. Okay, uh, the retweet level is about the same. Comments and replies about the same. So in some sense, the structure of how people are using it is about the same. And the number of users is about twice as high in the anti-protest as the pro. But look at the difference in who the users are. And this is very critical as part of an influence process. The In the pro-protest side, you have very few verified actors, more in the anti-protest side. You have very few news organizations, more in the anti-protest. You have a lot of actors who have the default profiles, which is often a signal that this is a bot or a troll. You have many actors, and that early on, about 83% of, of these ended up getting suspended. Now, a huge fraction of these are suspended, and it's very hard to, many of them are gone. But what you're seeing here is that the pro-protest group is has more focus, more troll and bot activity, more new accounts. They're talking about MAGA, QAnon, pro-Trump. They're anti-space maps and vaccine. They brought that group in and coordinated, you know, bridge, build bridges to them. They're, they're making appeals out to things like the Gateway Pundit, Breitbart, YouTube, uh, Fox News, Facebook. The anti-protest group, in co contrast, is really successful in pushing out their message, right? And any messages they have, they have very externally focused. They have, but they have bots acting in very diverse manners. They're not consistent. They're not coordinated. They also have people who are pro face mask and pro vaccine. There's some, they're, but they're, but they're not bridged in. They're just sort of there as part of the group, but they're not talking to each other. Whereas the anti face mask, anti vaccine people are talking to each other in the in the pro protest groups, and they're making calls out to things like NBC News, Washington Post, and so on. Which means that if you look at it, the pro-protest group is very centralized. The anti-protest is decentralized. One group has consistent messaging. The other has high variance. One is very proactive. The other is very reactive. OK, and so on. So you've got very, very different behaviors. Whenever anyone on the pro-protest side sends a misleading image or an accurate fact, the anti-protest side's right there calling it out. OK. And they're pushing out the message and other people are hearing you and saying, yeah, OK, we get that that's not true. However, that just sending disinformation was not the point of the pro protest site. The point of it was to build bridges and get this group proactive. And in fact, by the time they got to Pennsylvania, OK, the protests, which included some very legitimate reasons to protest, such as you don't have jobs, your loss of jobs. By the time you got there, you had new flags starting to appear in very in various uh, ones of the images. You had more discussion of the Bill Gates conspiracy, more discussing of Fauci being corrupt, and they shifted the argument from "I hate wearing face masks," okay, to "It's my right not to wear a face mask." which is a very powerful phrase. And if we think about rhetorical language, they shifted us for a very rhetorical thing. So they built all of these groups and that became the kind, of, and these are the rights they're talking about. They made, um, you know, you had a right to work, you know, and you weren't free if you couldn't work. Masks, mask, wearing a mask was a suppression of free speech, on and on and on. This is what they were bringing in, right? And this was being brought in by bots. So this is Pe uh, Pennsylvania. There was this big echo chamber that was built around uh, Governor Wolf, who was a Democratic governor. Uh, it has extremely high echo chamberness. The red dots you're seeing here are all bots. And what are these bots doing? Well, one of the bots is that girl, Sandra Five, and she's actually engaged in a back and build and excite maneuver. And what she's doing is she started out trying to back to, uh, ostensibly backing Wolf by talking to him a lot, talking about him a lot, but those backs always were why Wolf was doing a bad job. 
adding in various things to build a community, building links between anyone in Pennsylvania who was anti the who was pro the protest with those people who were pro protest in Michigan and in Vir in Virginia and in Minnesota and touting what was great and why those protests were so successful as to why this protest should go on. It was a tiny little protest, right? But it was significant because this was a trial run and it's thought to be a trial run for um, for January 6th. And they brought in all the change in mask maneuvers. They consciously changed what maneuvers they were using around masks as part of it. And part of this is not just polarizing and not just creating protests, but it was building an entire movement that was a what that was an anti-science movement. And this is showing you how all the different maneuvers can be brought together and used together as part of a very long run influence campaign on certain things. And in case you don't know it, there has been a movement, there's been an anti-science movement and an anti-science influence campaign that has been conducted for years, okay, by Russia against um, against science in the U.S., building this increased uh, increased focus. Uh, so influence operations, of course, are related to, as I mentioned, are very much related to online hostility. They're designed to control and manipulate online communities at the both the narrative and the uh, at the narrative and the community level, and they uh, are busy engaged in doing this so that they can create new communities that will behave in certain ways and then uh, get them to act in ways like we just saw with the protests. So when you're thinking about how to analyze social media data, it's important to think not just about who's talking to whom. OK, don't just get lost in the retweet network. It's important not to think just about what are they saying? Don't just get lost in trending topics, but look at them together and through time, because only in that way can you begin to understand these influence campaigns, many of which involve very interesting ways of coordinating and that we're just beginning to understand how to measure, track and think about. Thank you. With that, I want to open it up to more questions. You can type them in or you raise your hand and speak out. Either one will work with us. Go ahead, um, Bridget13. Uh, Dr. Carly, I have two questions for you on this. First, um, a lot of your focus here with the influence networks um, is on having two different camps, two different opposing topic groups for any given topic, both both for and against, and then basically exciting both of them in uh, in in opposite ways so that you can draw out conflict between them. Um, but are there, have there been any instances, and if so, what kind of dynamics have you observed um, with, say, uh, three different communities or, 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 or like higher numbers of communities and higher, higher body problems, so to speak, as opposed to the simple two-pole community problem? And, and if so, what kind of unique dynamics have you observed in, in, in the influence campaigns in those kind of coordination strategies that you did not see in the campaigns executed just on two topic groups? Um, so in the anti-vaccination movement, there's actually um, more parties that, there's actually parties within that, right? Because there's many reasons to not get vaccinated. And so there have been influence campaigns that have been tried to do to bring those groups together, uh, to bridge their differences, to get them to work together. That was one. So it was kind of, you know, we all, we know you have different reasons. We're not going to try to convince you, but instead we're going to try to get you to work together. And so those have been ones where they primarily use things like uh, bridging communities 
and then um, uh, boosting the leaders of all of them. So that's one type of one we've seen. Um, in terms of, I'm not saying there aren't any others. Um, the point that I would say that um, we've only been, we only kind of realized how to measure these things only in the past, you know, year and a half. So, yeah, we, we went with the polarization ones first. Um, so we actually haven't had enough time yet to go and look at a lot of other campaigns. The other place, though, that where I know we're starting to see one is in uh, the various responses. Um, how can I say this? Um, the various different arguments around um, climate change. Because there's so many different discussions there, so there that's another one. Uh, and then, then there's another one where, I, where there's multiple parties that we're already seeing and we're seeing them take different maneuvers, uh, which is around um, how, you, how you're going to actually, uh, how you do taxation to raise money to pay for all of the pandemic. Um, what maneuvers are we going to, what maneuvers have we seen so far? Like I said, mainly we've seen bridging ones so far. Um, so I don't know what other ones we will see, but I would expect in because of the way uh, other uh, other triadic situations have evolved is that you are um, with triads, you often get um, a ganging up strategy where the two will join to gang up on a third. And so I, I expect we will see ganging up strategies. And that would be done by both the bridging on the one case, but then also uh, a, a concerted joint attack, coordinated joint attack from two groups against the third. Uh, a, a divisive strategy where you try to cause two groups who sort of like each other to split apart by, by a third party doing that. Um, and in fact, um, that's one that, according to a friend of mine, that they think that they are starting to see uh, in the debate online debate uh, with respect to um, Netanyahu. I don't know. Sorry, I'm saying the name right. Netanyahu in Israel uh, is going on there. So I, I wish I had an even better answer for you, but like I said, this is pretty new stuff that you're seeing. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, my my last question then is uh, more about like since you had mentioned before how social cybersecurity is very much a multi and transdisciplinary field um, and that includes aspects from things like international law and political science. Um, I'm wondering about how uh, to to what extent the, are the fields existing knowledge and methodologies are able to prove um, quantitatively or, or to some degree of, of sufficient rigor um, motivations born or, or connections to um, like larger political or, or political strategies born out of political philosophy or political psychology. The two ones that I'm, I'm thinking of are um, that, that kind of do have an uncomfortable resemblance to the events that we've seen with influence operations and whatnot over the last few years is um, with, with um, um, Hannah Arendt. In her work on authoritarianism, one of the, the principles that she had laid out um, documenting the rise of Nazism was that um, a, a, in order to make a, demo a democracy or a, a close enough to a democracy state slide into authoritarianism, you don't need to have all the, the support of the entire population of the given country. You just need, I believe she said roughly a third to be yep. locked in as a pillar of support underneath you, and then you will have sufficient power to uh, take on all of the rest of the institutions of that country. That's one connection, I guess that would be to political philosophy. Uh, and then the second one, remembering some of the work and ideas 
that were developed by uh, Russia's Alexander Dugin and his neo-fascism ideas and, and some of his work and, and other surrounding authors work talking about, say, like uh, the connections to, say, uh, people with high right wing authoritarianism slash F score personality uh, scores and how that correlates to um, high uh, scores in the dark triad personality traits and how there's there there has kind of been a, a correlation to a subset of um, like uh, conservative voters, not all of them, obviously, and some like uh, some right wing authoritarians are also Democrats, but many of them tend to be conservative in, in how they vote um, and how and to what extent it can be proven that the the targeting uh, decisions and, and the operationalizing of that for disinformation and influence campaigns is actually taking such political psychology factors of different demographic groups into consideration in their planning so to speak do we do we have the ability to prove such a a through line right now or is that still something that we don't really have the ability to connect the dots sufficiently okay so the idea is can we prove that these theories are actually working are actually being used uh, by those seeking to influence us to influence us. Right. OK. Um, wow. Um, can we prove it? Uh, I think we're closer to proving it than ever, um, in part because as because the technology is letting us get much closer to getting at the timing of the uh, the timing of events and the sequence of actions and that's important for proving causality um to actually show that the actual perpetrators had read and were using those theories um several things one um we can often show that these things that are happening that are in alignment with those theories are happening more than would occur by chance so that is a kind of another kind of nail in the in the in the thing. But we but the hard part here is proving who's truly behind an event, right? So for example, um a lot of these bots out there, they have been bought by somebody, right? But who bought them was given money by a third party and finding the entire tracing back all the pathway to where it came from originally is uh, is often what is almost impossible to prove it takes huge amount of resources and huge amount of kind of forensics research so i cannot say that for example in many cases that putin read a rent and then said I want to do this strategy and then put the money into this which was then sent there which was then sent there which was sent there which then hired the Mexican firm uh um the Mexican marketing firm who then put all that all those disinformation campaigns in place okay I can maybe get from two steps away from Putin to how it how it actually paid to the Mexican firm to actually put that disinformation plan in place or so I can do that part. I can even show that the timing of those events, it might be consistent with the ranch or someone else or Dugan. Um, but showing that the people who are doing it had read those things, unless um, you'd have to actually look at their his, his, histories. Um, you know, you'd have to go in and see who they'd actually, where they went to school and so on. But I will, but, um, I think increasingly what we're seeing are, are things that are often very consistent with, you know, some of these other, with some of these strategies. But moreover, there's also communities um, occurring like in the dark web and in gaming in, in massive multiplayer online games where people trade strategies and tell each other strategies to use. 
So whether one of those had read of these, whether someone who's telling other people how to do these strategies had read or in these books, very, very likely. But I, I couldn't prove it. OK, thank you. Sure. Do you have another question? <clears throat> Dr. Carley, can I follow up on that question with regards to causality? Sure. Has there been any work with deep learning to integrate tools with what you're doing now, perhaps more manually or somewhat? Um, I mean, there are obviously simulation things that you've talked about as well, but it, it has deep learning been used to kind of look at this from a different perspective and different technology set? To the best of my knowledge, deep learning has not been used to try to uh, assess the causality of these things, nor has it been used to try to prove that someone was following a particular theory or theoretical path. More deep learning has been used for um, the bright, shiny, easy objects like, you know, can, can it discover a bot? Can it discover a deep fake? Can it discover uh, disinformation? And that's really where most of the deep learning focus has been, is on um, ca uh, classification and discovery so far. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A question in the chat. Um, how do bots create bridges to connect communities? Question mark. Can you explain the mechanics or the process further? Sure. So one of the ways bots can do this is through the a sophisticated use of app mentions. So let's imagine that I have 10 bots and each of those bots sends out messages that it, and each of the tweets is just simply a list uh, is a mention of the other bots, right? Now, out the algorithms are great, tend to make sure that if someone mentions you, that message is prioritized in your feed, right? And if you have a set of people, all of whom are messaging it, it's a group, and then anything anyone in that group mentions or says will get prioritized to you. So that's creating your bot echo chamber, your botnet. Step two, those bots then instead of mentioning, now that they're a group and they get, they're getting paid attention to, those bots now each will mention a couple of other people, right? So if I want to put, um, you know, you in a group with um, some other, I don't know, it's all of you in a group together, I would just send out tweets mentioning all of your names and all of you within in your feeds see not only me listed, but all of these other people listed because you'd see the tweets. And, the, and then those people would then be recommended to you to follow. And some fraction of you would then start following them, right? And now you've got a connection between the two groups. That's the app mention strategy. That is one way of doing it. The second way of bridging communities, and this way is uh, now illegal in the US, I believe, um, is that you used to get to buy bots from companies. Uh, you can still buy bots from companies, but you could, but they, but one of the lines in it is it said that the contract said they reserve the right from to to um, retweet from your account and to tweet from your account, send messages from your account. It didn't say that they're only going to send your messages, but most people look at that and just said, oh yeah, of course they they have to have that in order to send my messages, so they ignored it. So here we have the alt-right and the Southern women, evangelical Southern women. Okay, some of the women, I'm making up their names, you know, Martha and Joan, go and buy a couple of these bots to send out their messages to the group, right? Because, I mean, you don't want to sit there and send your tweet every hour on the hour. Just to make sure some, everybody hears it, right? And the more often you your same message is repeated, the more likely people are to hear it. So instead, you buy a bot service that does it for you. But this bot is service is the one that reserved the right. 
So now what happens is it's tweeting out, you know, Martha's messages, Joan's messages. And of course, since Martha and Joan are followed by other evangelical women, they're getting all these messages from them. And they think, yeah, that's my friend Martha. That's my friend Joan. No problem. Now all of a sudden they start that that account, that bot account, that bot, they send out some tweets as though it's from Martha because they reserve the right to retweet from her account or from Joan, but they're all right messages. And so now members of the women, and they're maybe mentioning members of the alt-right, but they're, they're alt-right members and people go, huh, I didn't know we believe this alt-right stuff, but you know, Martha and Joan are saying it, everybody around me knows, I guess that's what we know. And so they, you, they exploit your um, social cognition your ability, willingness to make groups right away to make you think you're in a group with these other people. And then you, so then you just start naturally following some of the people who are saying the same kind of things. Those, that's the social cognition way. So those are two different ways of creating bridges between communities. There can be many others, but there may be others. Those are two we have definitely observed. Okay, we come up on time. So I thank you very much for coming, being here today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the Ideas uh, Summer Institute. Um, stay with us for all the great, great talks coming up. Thank you, Jennifer. I've dropped tomorrow's sessions in the chat. Um, we'll be here in the same channel tomorrow at 3 p.m. with Dr. Osman Yegin. Um, who will talk about modeling and analysis of information spread over multi-layer networks. And then again at 445 with uh, Professor Jason Hong, applying social psychology to cybersecurity. So we'll see you all tomorrow.